I'm Justin Bone. And I'm Mike Bell. And this is the Bone and Zano Zone, where we are always on the lanes, off the charts, and on the mic. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Bone and Zano Zone podcast presented by BuddiesProShop.com. Mike, we got What's one up, heck buddy? Of show tonight, don't we? Justin, I think this is this is going to be the best one we've done in the three years we've been doing this. Yeah, um, I think so. <laughs> this is definitely the most anticipated one I think we've done so far. Yeah, I think with everything that's gone on in the bowling world um, and the comments that have already been made, uh, I think a lot of people are looking forward to this one. I know I am, and I know that you are. Oh, um, God, yeah. I think it's just it's going to be an absolute blast tonight. Uh, it not is. only with Brian, but with Rob, too, as well. Yep, and we encourage everybody to type in any questions or comments into the chat. We will bring some up. Um, but I think... Without any further ado, Justin, I want to uh, bring the guests on first. I think it's time we introduce the uh, the two guests. They have no reason to wait. No. And we're not going to do what's up in Wichita this week. Justin's going to go bowl the College Nationals Thursday. whip doo Who cares? This is more <laughs> precedent than what you're bowling on this week, buddy. Yeah, definitely. All right. So I'm going to bring on um, Mr. California first. So the holder of seven titles. One major, he won the U.S. Open. He is a two-time member of Team USA, Justin. Uh, the youngest U.S. amateur champion. And I think this is still the case. Uh, he can confirm this. He's the only person to have won the U.S. amateur title and the U.S. Open. And I believe he's the only person that has not received a green jacket after winning the U.S. Open. One of my close personal friends. We're on a daily phone call basis now. Robert Smith. What's up, gentlemen? Dude, how don't you have a green jacket? They still haven't given you a green jacket? I've got a green jacket, but the one that oh, they had me put jacket. on with Tennille wasn't the right size. And then I, I started moving around, so it might have just got lost in the mail. Who knows at this point? Okay. Who knows? Right. But, how are you guys doing? Good, bud. Good to see you. Good, how are you? Doing good. Doing good. Hiding up here uh, on the second floor of the bowling center trying to get some peace and quiet with you guys. All righty. Well, it's uh, it's going to be a good time. I'm glad to have you. It will be a good time. All right. So, Justin, the man of the hour. The man of like probably it. the last month of bowling. with The man of – yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I got the, the Mike Val intro ready for him. You you got to. I mean, we, we haven't had one of these in a while. No. And, you know, we've had n- numerous Hall of Famers from Bo Burden to Dad, Albi, Amleto. And um, we're going to bring on a 25-time titleist. The man won a single title for 12 years in a row on tour. He was the 1988 Player of the Year, uh, inducted into the PBA Hall of Fame in 1994, the USBC Hall of Fame in 2007. He was voted number 13 on the PBA's all-time greatest list. Um, Justin, we even spoke about this before. I always thought he had the greatest hair on tour. Um, we said that with Mona Celli and, uh, Matt McNeil disagreed. He gave his vote for the nicest hair to Mark Williams with that big fro. Yeah. So I want Brian Voss's opinion on that. Let's bring on the hall of famer, Brian Voss. BV. What's up out there? There he is. 
Well, since you asked, uh, Mark Williams, uh, he had his permed, okay? Mine was natural. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Love you, Mark, if you're watching. <laughs> and, and Robert's not far off with the hair either. No, I'm working on it. It's it's a lot lighter than yours, though. But, yes, I am working on it. <laughs> Hopefully, it won't bring back the uh, mullet, whatever that was. Hopefully, it'll be something a little more distinguished than that. Well, guys, they need a, not the green jacket. They need a gray jacket to kind of go with your goatee. and, and it, It's uh, coming. I know. It's I, like coming I like that. I like it. Shot, shots fired. Well, guys, thank you for coming on tonight. Um, Robert, I thank you for pulling the string and getting Brian in touch with us. My pleasure. And so, you on that, too. I know that's not something necessary you like to do, but uh, I think this one's going to be a good day for you. Yeah. So it seems like in the past month, uh, Brian has come kind of like come out of the woodwork and been very vocal about the state of competitive bowling. So I guess I'm just going to throw it right out there, Justin. I'm just going to throw the first bullet. Why all of a sudden? What what has sparked you to be so vocal right now? Why now? Um, the controversy with the uh, Purple Hammer. And then uh, the controversy with the uh, six storm balls, the secret uh, uh, inspection that took place with uh, Belmo and maybe some others, just, you know, this isn't the first time I've spoke up, okay? It was probably about uh, 17, 18 years ago. I am probably personally personal personally responsible for them taking off the uh, uh, social media part of the PBA website because uh, there was an error where I came up and and just just kind of told it like it was what I thought was going on with the equipment. Uh, you know, if you're going to come out, the I, I got to tell you, if you're going to come out with comments. You got to be able to back them up. You can't be afraid to get in front of people and, and debate. Um, I just, I'm just watching things happen that shouldn't happen. Shouldn't Example. happen. Example, please. The Purple Hammer. Okay. You know, it was sometime last year. Norm told me about this. He said, "B," he said, "You haven't been out there. You don't know what's gone with this 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 Purple Hammer." And he kind of told me. You know, says, hey, you know, there, there, there's some, there's some of these things that are tested in the '60s, yeah, but, it's... but it, it was grandfathered in for some reason. And you know, I've been on, uh, I've been on the end of the stick when you're on one uh, menu when you have an endorsement with one manufacturer, and there's some special ball out there that you can't use. That's a reason for a little uproar, especially if it's controversial like it is um it's the never-ending battle of, of the ball world and by the way i'm going to just say this real quick uh there's going to be some mentions about bowling ball technology tonight um and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna let you know none of this is the manufacturer's fault none of them they did nothing wrong they followed the rules they were given the green light but what I want to touch on tonight is why that green light was given. And if what has happened in the last three decades is good for bowling or bad for bowling. Okay. Are, you talking so, the, are you talking as far as when the residents came out in 92, when you guys were making the decision? Or exactly. Even, even before exactly. that, when it was the urethanes and they were making the decision about the urethanes. Yeah. Yeah. You when, go back that far with it. You can go back that far, and that would have been like the late seventies, uh, early eighties, when when there was a vote at the tournament committee. You know, they, they they had gone from hard rubber to plastic, which I don't think there was any controversy. I mean, plastic was was cool. They weren't black; they were pretty. You could make them different colors. But then the the uh, mention of urethane. I was in Europe in the service at the time, so I wasn't really around all of that. But evidently, the tournament committee voted 30 to nothing. They did not want to see urethane replace what was already existing. And, and, that, that, and that committee consisted of what? Players? 
players, uh, Hall of Famers, future Hall of Famers. Okay. It would make for a good podcast sometime in the future. Who's still alive? It was on that committee, and maybe they could share why they voted 30s nothing. I would only speculate, but um, we can ask Johnny uh, on that one, Justin. I'm sure he would know that one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I think George. Johnny, maybe guys like uh, George Pappas, uh, Slick, Gary Dickinson, if he's if he's still kicking it, I think he is. But I think there's some guys that 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 uh, may know the answer to that. But but. In my opinion, the transition from plastic to urethane was a little. It wasn't something that it, just it still allowed all of us to play on our side of the lane. I mean, even when urethane came out with me growing up, I was never, I, I was never shooting from the left side of the lane ever on a strike ball. Yeah, ever, even back in the urethane. But once resin came out, that that's when everything just went out the window as far as where to play, shapes, all yeah. that stuff. And, 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 you know, it, it surprises me that in the past, uh, these new eras, we were never really consulted. We were never really consulted. It was just thrown at us. Guys, here's the next uh, era. And just for some of you viewers out there, you, you know, anytime they come out with a brand new era, era thing, it had to repopulate the whole world because it was an, an advantage over plastic and obviously hard rubber. Repopulate the entire world. That's a tremendous amount of bowling balls and a lot of money to be made. And the same exact thing when they did it with resin. You had to have it. You had no choice. It wouldn't. Repopulate the whole world. Um, in, in, in looking back, you just have to say, was it good for the sport of bowling? And I, 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 well, what was it? Columbia itself pushed out a million units during the early mid nineties. Once resin came out, they were popping out a million bowling balls every year out of San Antonio back in the nineties, just Columbia <laughs> alone. I don't even know if the whole industry now pops out a million bowling balls. Yeah. And, you know, it was, it was like, uh, you know, I'm saying it again. It wasn't the manufacturer's fault. They were allowed to do this. And, you know, to be honest, they did it the right way. Uh, they made a heck of a lot of money, but they dispersed it. They disseminated it to, to, to the players in the form of uh, incentives on TV. If my recollection uh, serves me correct, uh, Double D, Dave D'Entremont, made $25,000 just from incentives by, I think it was during the Beast era or the Piranha era. Oh, but the uh, money was, my was, was, was going back to the players uh, through incentives and ball contracts, sponsoring tournaments. So it was easy not to really kind of complain so much. I was part of that family, that the disbursement of money. It was easy not to say anything. But when you look back, was that the when they made that decision? It, had they have consulted with the players, perhaps we would have never allowed it to happen. But but it was just thrown at us. This is it, guys. This is the next thing. I and, mean, uh, I, got, I got ten digits for the second place against Norm uh, at the Delco in '94, throwing the piranha. Yeah, I got ten digits for finishing second just from incentive money, which was yeah. huge compared to what they were basing it what they were offering if you threw any other Columbia ball that they had. So like a power torque, things like that, that was only mm -hmm. paying like 3000 for second versus the 13 I got back in 94, mm -hmm. just for finishing second place. That was just incentive money on top of the prize money for another 23. So yeah, I mean, that was 36 grand for finishing second. I mean, there, it was easy to not look. Aside from them sharing the money with the players, um, I've always been an advocate of more spin should get more strikes. It just makes more sense. There's more pin action. There's, 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 you have to roll it a little faster because you have more, more rotation. And the moment they came out with resin, it just kind of put everybody in the loop. All the knuckleballers, all the knuckleballers, all of a sudden have been resurrected. <laughs> I'm telling you just it just and, and the the um 
public posturing from the ball manufacturers in terms of the, their communication of why this is a good thing, because they wanted to give anybody a chance, no matter what, it, because it wasn't the manufacturer's fault that there's oil on the lane and that it changes and that they don't decide how it's out there. So they wanted to give anybody who wanted to bowl competitively some kind of ball that would match up to, to whatever, whatever was out there. And then you combine that with the introduction of cores. My God, oh boy. Oh yeah, cores, cores are what really changed everything because now if you were speed dominant, so say you had a rev rate of 250, cores would help get the ball into a roll. So that meant by the time the ball came out of the break point, the ball was rolling heavy. It wasn't rolling any different than say minor BVs on the back end because of these cores. I mean, when I learned to bowl, I used an Amflight 3 dot. I'm sure Brian threw something very similar. I mean, I learned to look at no cores and nothing. Black diamond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the biggest, the biggest thing that the cores did was they, they, they now, we now, we're now using bullet balls that flare. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so people that, you know, I think all competitive bowlers know, and if they don't know, they should know. But back when we used balanced bowling balls, you let go of that ball. First thing, it hits the lane, it picks up on the front part of the lane, and then it is always riding on that same ring. Yeah. Always riding on that same ring. So the mid lane didn't break down that much and not that fast. That's why we, we were able to have ABC squad and never get left a fourth arrow just because the mid lanes weren't torch. You played the heads. Yeah, the back and, end. No, but... Yeah, we, and, and some carry down. But for the most part, uh, you know, where you're standing uh, was, was dictated by... by by the heads, not so much the mid lane. And man, when you put flare on a bowling ball, it's always rolling on a fresh part of the a fresh surface of the ball. So it's an eraser head, an entire line of oil. Now, in my opinion, what should have happened was it should have gone through some kind of three to six month uh, evaluation or R and D by the guys who did the lanes just to illustrate look guys if you're going to introduce this flare now you're going to watch how fast these lanes change and so the discrepancy from the right to the left was even further uh in my opinion that was that was wasn't it amf that had what the ultra angle or the angle plus i forget which one it was but that was the first one that flared on accident and i yeah, think the they had angle. to recall all those bowling balls i think that was what late 80s yeah, and that was the first 80s. ball I saw that regularly flared and people freaked out and sent them back to AMF. Yeah, it was freaky just to see it. We'd never seen anything like that before. Oh, yeah, that was weird. I think Malacosta won with one of those balls, if I'm not mistaken. But anyways, it's it's it, it, so guys my age and, and the guys a little older, we bowled competitively with hard rubber. We experienced it. We felt it. We saw it for years. And we bowled competitively with plastic and, and, and stable balls, and we felt it, and we saw it for years. And then when we go through these next few eras, uh, it, 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 it should have never happened. should have never happened. Where would be – My era would was plastic urethane. I mean, I, I used a wine Utah when the lanes were tight back in the day, but mainly the ball I threw was uh, Black Knight. That was my ball of choice growing up. And I threw that everywhere right. around LA. But You're yeah, right, once yeah. the resin balls came out in 92, which I was 18, that that was a whole different demon. That was a whole yeah, different it just, demon. It took me almost a year and a half to learn how to throw those things. Yeah. Just because I didn't understand that the ball didn't hook early anymore. It hooked late. So, I mean, that was, you know, most of us were so used to looking just at the arrows and where we stood. And that was, you know, like you said, Brian, playing the heads. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I'm worried about what the ball is doing at 45 feet, which used to never even be a thing. And all of a sudden now this is an option and it's a necessary thing to watch this ball 45 feet. You start getting into what the ball's offered. It started creating more angles. So yeah, the guys that figured out how to do it, they, they took off strikes, scores, everything like that. The ones that couldn't understand it and missed the boat and kept their eyes too short on the lane they never really figured out what was going on because they were still so worried about the heads that these bowling balls wanted to be done three quarters of the way down the lane. Every bowler's at one quarter, so now this gap of scores averages took off. So who did it really affect the most then? So 
what guys from the, your era, Brian, like everybody says Ballard was affected the most. Who really was hurt by it and benefited the most from it? I'm not going to mention names. I'll mention okay. category. The guys that had low low ball speed, low ball speed that couldn't uh, couldn't create more ball speed. Dale Ballard, I'm telling you what, during that those hammer days and those those, he was phenomenal. He was unbelievable. Uh, but but when when the resin came out, he just. You know, he's he's he, he, beautiful footwork, uh, real square shoulders. Just couldn't get any any in, enough ball speed to compete. Yeah, the, the resin ball uh, balls were uh, uh, the guys that couldn't create more ball speed, and it benefited the guys with uh, no hand, and also guys that that didn't approach the sport in a way that they felt creativity and imagination was a uh, part of greatness because it allowed a lot of people who didn't know how to do those things to go out there and, and, and just select a ball drill a certain way with a certain cover stock and, and not make them do it, but certainly help them do it. So that's another reason for my um, uh, uh, controversial topics. I, I, I truly believe that if, you, if you're a great bowler, it's really two things you either – can do the exact same thing over and over again better than anybody, or you have a creativity with your hand and your knowledge about mechanics to be able to create more speed or less, roll it straighter. And I'm not just talking about axis rotation. I'm talking about actually tilting it a little more on certain conditions to be able to just do anything, anything with your hand and your knowledge of mechanics to take advantage of what's out there. I, I would when you have I, all I, these I you know, it feels like, you know, if you watch a lot of the guys now, I mean, it feels like there's not a lot of variety outside of maybe a speed control thing. But, you know, tricks, tilts, like you're saying, I mean, I had to learn how to play straight when I came out on tour. No questions asked. Yeah. I mean, I asked you kind of times how to play straight and stuff, you know, just learning, trying to figure it out. Because I knew that my trick would show up every so often, but 85, 90 percent of the other time I'd have no clue. I had to become versatile. The way this game looks now, it's it's. I think it's way too equipment oriented, way too equipment oriented. But yeah, uh, folks out there, real quick, uh, Smitty, in my opinion, would be in the Hall of Fame. He'd have twenty titles if we would have never gone to res or course. Okay, that's just my opinion because. <laughs> When I first saw this 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 uh, big old meatball bowl, it was unbelievable. <laughs> I'd never seen anything like that with a hand, never. And to this day, in the entire world, I've seen maybe this many that can do what you did to a bowling ball. So, uh, uh, shame. It's a shame. Brian, Bye. thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, you know, when resin came out, I really didn't like it. And I still don't like it because it just, it, 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 it just, it felt like it just started getting to the point where now I'm crisscrossing with the lefties and, you know, what they do mattered, what I do. And, you know, lofting the gutter probably killed my career, even though at that time with my game plan, I, I had to throw it over the gutter. You had to. Yeah, I, I had to. And I went there quick. I was usually the first one there. It, it, but it, it, to me, that should never have been even a thought. It should never even have been a thought. That should not be part of the game. It was never intended to be. Um, but the you ball changed ball, your grip just to get less roll on it, didn't you? Yeah, you I had to learn to get less roll on it just so that way I wouldn't be roll on it. that way. So that fast. is what is a – that's an amazing, amazing story. Amazing. Should never happen. Never. So we're going to talk about equipment Justin, okay. all right. So I, I and yeah. lanes and whatnot. Go ahead, go ahead. And I, I do want to talk about like how we're talking about the the plastic and the urethane era, and kind of like what I've seen because obviously I wasn't around or even thinking about bowling when you guys were going through the the plastic to to urethane to resin, and seeing it at the the team masters environment and the skill bowling environment where we're when we only have the the pearl urethane ball and we're bowling on seven mils of oil. 
this is like I'm hearing very similar things to what I had done at an event like that, where transition wasn't a crazy amount. I wasn't moving a whole lot. I was making tricks with my hand when I was playing on the gutter on the short pattern um, and just had to repeat shots over a, an extended period of time. And that's what it was about. Um, and I think that'll lead us really good into our first question of the night. Um, okay. Bowling ball, skill bowling. Should mm -hmm. all bowling balls be the same for everyone? Um, no. And should they be plastic, urethane? What What do you see there? Smitty, I'll, I'll answer after you if you want. All right. Um, Here we go. Round one. If you ask any competitive player, all of us, all we ever ask for in this game is fairness. Fairness. That's what we want. A lot of times when you go bowl and, you know, being on tour, I mean, me and Brian had the luxury of having bowling balls at our whim. A lot of the other guys don't have that opportunity. So what happens is it's not so much that the game is still not fair because the opportunity to get these bowling balls are there for you. But the thing is, is that there's such a wide variety that you, some people can actually cover almost every aspect of ball shape just with equipment. Somebody else who might be more talented has inferior equipment may not have a chance because they just don't have enough equipment to match up. With that being said, I'd love the fact that if everybody had to throw the same bowling balls, I mean, I thought the most fair tournament we had on tour in a long time was the one that most ball companies dreaded. And that was the plastic ball tournament. Mm -hmm. When we bowled with plastic, I mean, we had two plastic bowling balls. You couldn't alter the surface and you can, you could dictate it within the specs that you wanted for static weights. I had a finger positive and a thumb negative bowling ball. And I ran with those two and it was perfectly fine. And nobody seemed to complain. Nobody complained about anything. You couldn't it touch wasn't, the surface? oh, I got a bad ball shape, or this ball sucks. Or, I mean, we were all playing with the same stuff. But you couldn't touch the surface on those balls? I don't think we could have. Okay. I think the first year we couldn't, and then the next year you could do anything you wanted. I think that was when Brian uh, Zeeson. Yeah, that might have been right. But even still, yeah. I mean, but, you know, equipment-wise, that would be, I mean, there's got to be some sort of standard, especially if you're going to talk about an elite level of play. Or even competition play as far as maybe bowling, you know, nationals, the Open Championship. But with such a variety of bowling balls and stuff out there now and what they offer for shape, I mean, there's, <clears throat> I mean, is it the equipment that's making everybody bowl good on certain days or is it the player? I can't tell the difference. And, it, you know, that drives me nuts a little bit. Okay. Um Real quick, he mentioned something uh, some some of the viewers uh, uh, may not understand. He's, he said quarter positive, quarter finger, quarter negative, quarter thumb. If you take you know, a bowling, a 16-pound bowling ball, it's got uh, 16 ounces in a pound, 16 pounds. That's 256 ounces in this bowling ball. One quarter of those ounces, that's one 1,024th of the mass of the ball had an influence static weights yep it's really amazing and when you go from that to a half a pound core you think that half a pound core is going to have some kind of influence on it so when, when when to answer your question should every ball be exactly the same well it even if every ball was exactly the same because we all have different finger holes, finger size. So when we drill it, the statics are going to be a little different. So, but the design of the ball, in my opinion, there should be a standard um, surface. The guts, you know, you've got options here. You take a, you take the uh, what we used to use in the old days, a pancake weight block, or if you kind of look at the skills ball, it's got a core in there. But if you can imagine the density of a core surrounded by the same density material, the core is not going to have any effect. It is, there's nothing there. But when you take a core and make it ever so slightly heavier than what is surrounding it, then you get a little bit of play, just enough where a high level professional can see the difference between a quarter finger and, and, and a quarter thumb. But one 1,024th of the mass of the ball influences how that ball rolls. And you can still use that slight little bit to aid on certain shots. But, but the surface, absolutely all day. 
Absolutely. We need Yeah, I'm not a big fan of altering yeah. surfaces either because sure. that leads into lane integrity. And after what I saw at the Masters, where it seemed like 70% of the field was thrown through the <clears> grid, <throat> you know, by the end of the first game, halfway through second game, everybody's in front of the ball return, fifth, sixth arrow, because everybody's throwing mm-hmm. charcoal. So, and that's what I, I want to leave. Charcoal, so lane integrity has gone and blown out the window. So, why do we even have lane patterns if a field can just go in there in a matter of 15 frames and just destroy what any rebels? So, so I'm I, with I'll, Brian on that surface. I'll, I'll lead into that one next. So, Justin, I got the day by day recap of Rob at the Masters. I was kind of like his psychiatrist. He was calling me and just venting every, after every block. So, so, Rob, why don't you tell everybody your three days at the Masters, like, what did you see? And I know you told me, you've, you've told me that you feel like a dinosaur. Why? It, it, everybody hooked it. But it was not like everybody was hooking it with a purpose, trying to play the pattern of what they were trying to achieve. Everybody walked in playing surface on their bowling balls to play where they wanted to play. That in and of itself was just the craziest thing. So I'm sitting there trying to, you know, somewhat try to play where I think the shot is, this and that, so on. And by the time I'm ready to to get going, I've had to move 15 left. My break points changed. This, the integrity of the whole thing's gone. With that on top of, you know, bad topography at Gold Coast, which, you know, is no fault itself. Topography is whatever. But the lane oil not being able to hold up Where's the fairness in this game? Because now if you go on a pair and everybody throws 360 grid and then the next pair I jump over, I go and I have three lefties and a guy that's throwing a polished ball, that is not going to play the same anymore. And then the next pair over is not going to play the same either because who knows what they've done with that surface. So they can oil the lanes all they want, but if we're allowed to just cook up the front and tear up the oil in the front, who, why, why is it even going to bother? Because once you start going pair to pair, there's nothing consistent. There's nothing consistent anymore. So that was my masters. Every pair I went to, I had no clue what the ball was doing. I, you know, every shot was a panic and I had four deuces in 15 games. It was a lot of spare shooting. And, you know, I'm watching some of the guys and they're getting it to hook from the out of bounds. And some of them are throwing charcoal from fifth arrow. And some, I mean, it's just, I didn't understand it. It made no sense to me. And, you know, I yeah, trying to make sense of what happens and how the game is broken down. I mean, it, it's beyond me. And I'm not sure what it is. I mean, I know the surface is a big deal, but I mean, making the ball try to hook at 20 feet where, you know, beforehand, even, you know, with my era, everything was trying to be broke down mid lane and further down. Now the heads are blowing up, but the problem is the heads are blowing up and there's nowhere to go because the bowling balls are chewing up so bad. We run out of lane. The gutters get in the way. And I mean, and you just, you watched it all the way through. I mean, you know, burn squad, nobody could play left on the burn squad because everybody played left from game one. And it, it was just, it, it, I don't know what it resembled. It's, it, it, it's got to be a nightmare for left-handers too. I mean, when you guys are oh, playing, yeah, that far in, you're just, <laughs> It's just impossible, impossible using the stuff that we do to make it fair from left to right. And, and, and it's people sit there and they say, well, it's always been like that. You know, even back in the 60s and the 70s, we've got machines out there nowadays that can do some unbelievable things. These oil machines are fabulous. Are you a fan of asymmetrical oil patterns? Do you like asymmetrical oil patterns or no? Uh, I'm a fan of a different challenge, a lot of different challenges. Well, I'm talking like when we bowl at the same time, a lefty and a righty, and also the left side of the lane has a different shape of oil than the right side. Are you a fan of that or no? What choice do they have? Well, I mean, why are they dictating how one should be oiled and the other side should be oiled differently? Who's dictating that? They're anticipating how much they're going to break down on the right side and still keep the left-handers, uh, you know. It's it's a vicious, <clears throat> vicious way we play right now. It, 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 I can't it, stand it, asymmetrical oil patterns. I think it's so fair that we're already under the gun about what 
who pushes the button and who dictates oil patterns. And now you got somebody dictating shapes from left to right to really start alienating the left and right issue. I, I yeah. can't stand. I think it's horrible. Well, I'll, I'll just, you know, this is, this is just my opinion. When I go back to uh, how I define greatness, we have machines that are unbelievable that can make anybody look like an idiot. They can make you play. Or, and I don't want to say make you play. I want to say encourage you to play a certain part of a lane a certain way. And if we can get it to where the change is so small, you still have variety but well, the variety, slow it down slow it down slow so it, it resembles it up, uh, roll it off your hand different do something different because if the thing is if what i'm talking about is is if you come up with a certain pattern that is global it's going to favor somebody it's going to favor a certain ball speed and and, yeah. and I, I don't like that. I want to challenge people. You can put enough patterns out there in a spectrum uh, that will encourage people to, let me think, go practice? You mean I've got to learn how to let go of it differently? <laughs> hey. Okay. But if you if you really, if, if you're going to solve problems, you first have to understand, is that a problem left to right? It always has been. Is it solvable? It is more solvable if we, 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 we're we competing in an environment that changes very little. And the only way we can play in an environment that changes very little, if you grasp this concept, is to regulate the surface of that ball and get rid of that flare. Get rid so, of it. So get rid of pads altogether. So Aberlon pads. Okay. No, oh, that's, that's, that's strike one. Get rid of the Aberlon. Every no, ball shot. Everybody, get, lane integrity will hold up. At least something. Why, yeah. why do you need a pad? Why would you need a pad? If if somebody else doesn't need it and you need it, that means, A, you don't have as much hand as they do. Two, you, you, you've got to slow down and you don't know how to. Three, uh, you don't know how to go around it and you should learn it. Four, you but don't know pad, how to move your feet, so you keep sanding it until it works where you want to stand. Yeah, it's... it's, it, it's that's... Yeah. So... So then, so Brian, you said there was a the tournament committee back in the seventies that they tried yeah. to outlaw urethane, right? So, yes. and in a little bit of homework I did, and I think you even said it on one of your your comments that you were part mm -hmm. of that committee in the eighties that yes. tried to outlaw sandpaper and weight holes, right? Yes, correct. So this has been going on for almost forty years that you've been trying to get rid of the pads and the sandpaper. Steve Hoskins and I, uh, you know, we we we. Uh, Chummed, chummed a little bit together. We talked bowling. We talked uh, integrity, and both of us uh, agreed, and and others did. Uh, but the argument, let me tell you, this is really the, an interesting argument, and it actually came from uh, Johnny Petraglia. Okay? Ah, it's a valid argument. He says you're telling me that that uh, you wanna you wanna keep the outside of the ball shiny to get it to skid, and we wanna we wanna sand it to get it to hook. What's the difference? Okay. I sat there and I thought for a while, all right, who am I to dictate that, that, that uh, uh, getting a ball to skid is better than getting a ball to hook? I mean, he kind of really, he had me going there. Uh, but, but, but the extra hole, uh, it, it fell on deaf ears. The sanding of the ball, it fell on deaf ears. And I lasted about a week in that tournament committee after that. There, I, it was a bunch, <laughs> bunch of... Uh, People, I, I, I'm not going to say any names, mm -hmm. but, but uh, I really wish, wish that players were consulted about these different eras and the different things that they did. They didn't do that. This is where we're at. So now we can sit here and complain about they should have done this. They should, but this is where we're at. Now, what do we do? We've talked about the balls. Uh, there are, uh, Solutions. If 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 you if you agree with some of the things that Robert and I are saying, having said that, people back home that own pro shops are saying they're 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 knocking themselves in the head. Uh, manufacturers are looking at their bottom line, uh, but they got to know. They got to know it was given to them. The green light was turned on. This was given to them, and a lot of people got rich by having this given to them. 
if this technology that, that we've been doing and evolving was the direction that it should go, and it sh then why stop? Why stop? Let's make them even softer and put more on the lanes. Let's make 12-pound yeah. cores. Why stop? If they're stopping, they, it's an admission that, okay, maybe it is too far. And, and then, they, of course, they backed off. Now there's no extra holes. But still. You yeah, but now we have three ounces of side weight, which exactly. means we have unbelievable exactly. layout opportunities, exactly. which, again, yeah. Exactly. Uh, I, I, and I don't take pleasure talking about this, knowing that I've got a lot of friends. I mean, lots of them in the ball business that, uh, you know, I'm going to have to face sometime. But most of them, I think. Um, yeah, but we're talking, I mean, this is not a competitive. If they're bowlers, they understand what I, where I'm coming from. And we're in a tough situation right now. But if it doesn't stop, we're, we're going to get into the two-handed in, in, in just a minute. But if it Boy, doesn't God. stop. No, no, I mean, we're here to debate. We're here to discuss. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, part of discussing and offering solutions is reflecting on the past, but projecting where we're going to be at in the future if things don't uh, change, if we just keep going along this path. Where are we going to be? Um, and, 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 and if you're smart and you look at stats and you're very observant about what's going on, you can come to a conclusion about what's gonna what it's gonna be like in ten years, and um, um, make some decisions, uh, some tough decisions, um, or there's gonna be consequences. And, and I love this sport. And then the only reason, you know, I could disappear into the wind. Never. The only reason I'm vocal is because I love this game. I owe it to this game. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, sand, papers, extra hole, all of this, was it necessary to elevate this sport uh, to, to, to a level that, that, that maybe we haven't even seen yet? We've got technology out there to make this game so freaking cool. Um, I, I still believe we're a sleeping giant, but, but we, we, we've got to make some moves. We've got to do something. So, so, so I, I got a question before Mike, you get to the next yeah, one. Yeah. Go ahead. So you bring up how the the change and the evolution of the game from plastic to urethane to resin has brought in so much money and made people rich and brought money to players and the industry and the sport as a whole. How it's brought in so much money, and then if we go back to plastic or whatever era that you would like to go to, how can you make it to where you can keep the same amount of money coming in? At, while still having a successful sport, while still giving the players incentives, while still keeping the, the ball companies afloat, while making the game yeah. fair again. Okay, that's an excellent question. That's an yes. excellent question. And and when when uh, when I talk about the guts of the ball, hey, the surface, you, monitoring the, I gotta go make a run and get a phone card. I will be right back. Okay. Be talk I'll time. be right I'll here. Go. I'll still be talking. Get a haircut too, Smith. <laughs> Yeah. When when um, uh, when I, I always say that all balls should be almost exactly the same, almost give the ball companies a, a little bit of leeway in there so they can still uh, be competitive. They can still um, offer something that may give the illusion that their ball is better by by signing the best in the world. Everything that I've ever said, and every, I've always thought about the best in the world and how to grow it, how to grow it. Is it easier to grow? Well, I'll give you a couple of scenarios. And, and, and there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that happen in this sport, which uh, uh, has contributed to the decline in membership. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of those. One of them, in my opinion, is definitely the equipment. How many people have we priced out? It's a freaking expensive sport. When you've got to, you know, when pros are drilling 50 to 100 balls a year, uh, it's free to them. They pay for the drilling, but it's free. And, uh, you know, you've got some up and coming kid who doesn't have a connection. Uh, uh, that's an expensive. It's an expensive hobby. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an expensive venture. Uh, it's also how many people have we aggravated out of the competitive scene? 
It's a pain in the butt to go to a tournament. You got to have your own SUV. How many balls you got? Well, I got 16. Well, if you got another car? <laughs> How many people really got aggravated out of that? A lot, in my opinion. A lot of people got aggravated. So people got priced out. They got aggravated out. They got aggravated out. If you wanted to develop a, a junior bowlers and kids, which really is is going to be some emphasis a little bit later, it, it is all about the kids that are there because they are the future, they're the generation. Is it easier to get a child involved when you can just give him a ball? Or uh, consult with the parents and, and say, without lying, uh, if you want your son to be competitive, he's going to need some equipment. And by the way, after, uh, you know, you, you bowl with some of the equipment, some of them, they only last 50 or 60 games. It's not that they're a bad ball anymore, but they're just not the same. Um, is it easier to convince a parent to, 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 to get them into there when it's less expensive and they don't have the hassle of getting all of this equipment? In my opinion, absolutely yes. If you're the best bowler in the world, and I brought this up a, a few other times, you deserve a bowling ball in your likeness with your name on it. Even though it may still have the cover stock, if, 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 if some of my ideas come to fruition, it's the same cover stock. It's just an, you can make it look infinite any way you want. Your picture, whatever on there is your ball. You design it. You get royalties off of it. Um, the ultimate question, I think, is, is going to come down to what is more important, growth in membership, growth uh, in competitive bowling, or maintaining uh, all the jobs in the current system that, 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 that's happening right now in, in, in the ball industry? What's more important? Is there something in the middle? Yes. Is there something in the middle? It cannot be one ball because one ball is one vendor. The ball, the, I, I, I don't support that. But one type of bowling ball within a very, very low spec. So I, I do want you to know that I think about how to grow this sport. Um, and, and that it, it, I would never say anything and never suggest any idea that I thought was going to kill the sport. Yeah. So. So. Uh, I got uh, another one here. So when mm -hmm. we're talking about making this a little bit more simple with the amount of options and bowling balls that we have, I look at all of the other sports that are dominating the sports entertainment market per se right now. Mm -hmm. Football and basketball, I'm going to use as the two prime examples. Play with the same ball the entire game. Not saying that bowling needs to be played with the same ball by the entire field because that's just unrealistic in our sport. Right. But – is there a way that we can minimalize that or even like baseball or golf where there are different clubs for different reasons? Um, there are different bats for different reasons. When you look at basketball, only thing that's really different on the court are the, are the shoes that these guys are wearing. How can we get our sport that is to that level or similar while still main, maintaining that difference while still having the decent amount of money come from the sport while also increasing membership and getting more of these kids involved in our sport at a, at a lower cost level. Well, well uh, uh, you mentioned a few comparisons and, and I'll give you, you my opinion on those comparisons. Uh, when you mentioned bats and golf clubs and uh, tennis rackets, those are simply an extension of the human mechanics. There is no extension mechanics with bowling. That ball is stuck right on your hand. There's nothing in between there to make longer or more flexible or something like that that no but if you look at the game ball the game ball other than golf it's the same it's the same however even though golf the golf ball has evolved it goes longer now you can get balls that go higher or lower you can't switch them during the round you start with the ball you got to use it the whole time but never did they allow an object in the middle of a golf ball that would make it go right to left or left to right we did that. We did that. So how to keep everybody happy? I am not a genius. I wish I had that answer. But 
I'm presenting the problems. Uh, uh, I'm, how? Under the existing environment, can we make it fair? I think fair is really uh, extremely important. Why would any kid pursue a, a game or a hobby against his friends if he knew it wasn't fair? You got yeah. a new ball. I, uh, you know they're gonna they're gonna complain. They're just they're not gonna. They, they may not understand the definition of integrity, but they will understand what integrity means when somebody has an advantage. Uh, you have to do that. So, so, so in this current environment that we're in, and using all the things that we're using, is it possible to grow this sport and maintain the status quo? In my opinion, absolutely not. So the only how do we grow the sport? I, I, I've given you some reasons that I think that uh, will help grow it. Um, one more thing I'm just going to say, uh, amongst other things here. Uh, the lane that we play on is simply a picture of wood. That's it. It's a picture of wood. It's not wood. It's a picture of wood. If I were to build a bowling center and I wanted it my way, my vision, you guys remember Sega Golf? Ever play Sega Golf back yeah, in the days? Yeah. You've got golf. this where the green is a, it's a neon green and it's got a grid and the, the 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 hills are superimposed so you can see. It was my bowling center and I I could uh, summon the bowling gods to make it the way I see it the way, the way I visualize it in my mind. What I would do is uh, oh, let me see if I got a piece of paper here. I'm just going to show your viewers if they don't. Here come, here come, here come the props. This is we like props, Justin. Yeah. Props All right. Well. Here we go. When oil companies uh, illustrate uh, an oil pattern, they'll show it to you like this: more oil in the middle, on the, okay, than there is on the outside. Okay, yeah, it could be a little flatter. That's that illustrates the amount of oil. Flip it upside down, and now what you're looking at is a graph of friction. It's the same oil, but you're looking at it as a graph of friction. That's the way I see lanes. I see them in hills and valleys. And if you put a couple different slopes in there, uh, you did this, and you illustrate it in a three-dimensional grid on the lane, and you put an oil pattern on top of that grid, which represents that grid, and it never changed. And <laughs> you had a lot of different lanes in the house. Number one. The people who walk in off the street will look at that and say, "Whoa, I can see that little hill there. I can, I, I can see that." Uh, you've solved one of the biggest problems uh, that bowling has. We're playing on something invisible, even though if we create this oil pattern and put it on the lane, the, the three-dimensional grid, grid that you're putting out there represents the, the the oil pattern, so you can see those things. Yeah, but it, that 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 concept is useless if you're going to allow balls to be used that destroy it. Now, how yeah. can you do real quick? How can you put that display in a lane? Well, you either uh, create that picture, put it in a three dimensional grid, but the only thing is, then then that's permanent. Or you take a projector of some kind that's going to project this three dimensional grid, and then you put the pattern on top of there. I believe there's already a patent in that. Um, uh, projecting this three-dimensional grid but like i said this is only this is the way i i see bowling and, and in the future if i could make my bowling center and make it stand outside of this current box that's the way that i would do it uh, so but don't they do that with the with the colored oil now they kind of give you that illusion well, at least, yeah, at least yeah. With the color oil, you can see the transition of it, too. It goes away, kind of pushes down. You can see it on the bowling ball stuck but, to it. But doesn't that give you yeah. this, like a false sense of like what it really is? Like people are going to say, oh, there's a big block from here to here. I'm just going to throw it there. And they think that's the wall. It's far from it. Like they're far giving from. you misinformation on that. Like, I, that that's, not, that's not helping anybody that's competing, yeah. right? I don't know. We're talking At about the blue oil the concept that I just described. No, I'm talking about the colored oil they use on the shows now. I just, yeah, I don't, I don't. Uh, there's topography out there. There's carry down. There's breakdown. There's, there's. Uh, people don't understand. It doesn't take much topography. A sixteenth of an inch over eight boards will influence a ball to go left or right. 
Same thing to front to back. If you got it higher than, than it is lower, you're going to have uh, – it's just like water. If there's any topography on there, water will go to the lowest point. So the the the, the expense of putting a, a – a, a, getting a lane to get in there and be perfectly flat is uh, – it's a lot of expense. Uh, and I'm all for – Having lanes map, as you can see the topography, uh, it does make a difference if you understand it. Uh, but I'm not a fan of the oil, the blue oil. I, I don't think it, it's not the right at way. Least, at least the way. oil does show transition somewhat. But yeah, I mean, but even when you look at that, you can see what the bowling balls do to the oil patterns. I mean, you know, they just chew them up and destroy them. So the oil pattern doesn't have any integrity on it. You, yeah. you talk about topography. There's no place that had that biggest variant than Reno for years. Oh, jeez. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, closer closer to the train station, the more it sloped to the right. <laughs> it was like it was like the whole bowling center was tilted, uh, you know, to, so the left-handers always had hook and the righties had hang. I'm telling you. It, it was, wasn't like that the first two years. I liked that joint the first two years it opened up. Ever since then, forget it. Yeah, that was terrible. Yeah. That, but, that's yeah. a perfect example. Well, it's a, People forget uh, the ground moves out here. That's why, like, even with our bowling center, because the ground's moving, you know, the, it, the lanes are going to warp. They change. They do weird things. Nothing you can do about it unless you're going to constantly yeah. flatten them out. But, yeah, topography should be part of the gig. The oil pattern yeah. should hold up and allow the topography to show what it is. I, oil pattern have, is not meant to just be destroyed and manipulated. Do you have that book handy or no from the Masters? Yeah, you want to give me a minute? I can go grab it. Yeah, let's, why don't we do that? We'll get more props. Because they gave I you think... a topography? Oh, yeah, I got a topography Did book. They... It's, like a, it's like a really bad coloring book. I mean, it's... <laughs> so, all right, so There's a Rob... lot of stuff going on with this joint, so give me a second, guys. Yeah, so let, let Rob get that. So I, I got another one for Brian, Justin. So I want to get back to, like, the pads and whatnot. Uh -huh. So if we were to get or somehow get rid of the pads, don't you think the ball reps are just as guilty as the pads as well? for helping it's it's not against the rules okay not against the rules no no i, I do i think um uh ball reps should have less in a role during competition yeah uh, i don't i don't know to what effect um uh i haven't been out on, on tour for a while but but um once the tournament starts you know there there should really they should be just off in the back but no i don't i don't i don't blame them it's not against the rules make a rule and that that's different they're just doing their job interesting interesting so i, I want to wait for robert to get back here um okay. was i think the the book he's going to show is quite interesting it's 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 a bad coloring piece is what it is well, it just it, it just illustrates it, it, that's it, it would be really nice and I think professional if when they showed up in a house they were given this little handbook. You know, like the golfers, you pull it out, you get to this pair, right? You see this lane's got a little bit of hang on this side. Uh, you know, you could see all those things. But I was doing. Uh, we were at the. Uh, it was the uh, world uh, world championships in Munich, Germany. Me and uh, Ted Thompson were doing the color along with uh, Keith, somebody, I, I think. But uh, this was during an era where Kegel had come out with the mapper that was, that was mapping topography and actually showing people why this lane has got hang and why this one hooks a little earlier. And when we got on the television show, we, we weren't allowed to discuss that. We weren't allowed to discuss that. And the reason being, because two reasons, number one, it makes the owner look bad. What do you, you don't know how to put in lanes because one of the pair that they came to, uh, we looked at the topography and said, look at this left side, left side's got, got free hook, right side got some hang. And sure enough, we, we weren't allowed to discuss it, but when they came over there, that's exactly what happened. So, um, I think it should be, routine give everybody yeah, and, a book and i want to yeah. talk about the the <laughs> the the topography report and kind of like what i've seen from it because i haven't i haven't experienced it a whole lot 
Um, and there are some comments in the chat that I kind of want to touch on about how there are benefits to it. Um, have you seen we, the book, Justin, or no? I've I have seen it, multiple books from or multiple topography reports from events that I bowled. Um, and I want to specifically go to Teen Masters in 2018 when it was at South Point at the Plaza. Okay. Um, because we we had the report. It was super helpful. It was super useful. Again, back to bowling with these pearlized urethane balls with super low diff, super small cores, um, seven mils of oil on the lane. Uh, very simple to where the topography had a big difference moving across the house and moving pair to pair. And when we had those books, it really made – those books super handy into finding those the the answers to those questions on a much quicker basis but i think mm -hmm. with the oil on the lane when you go from seven seven mils and plastic balls to reactive balls and balls that flare a bunch to 20 30 mils now the oil has so much more of a meaning because it's a physical substance on the lane that however many shots are thrown almost has more of an impact on the topography. The topography can help, but when we're bowling on a lot more oil, it the oil makes a little bit more of a difference. Yeah, and see, yeah, at the Masters, you know, I, by game two, the topography was thrown out the window. It didn't matter. The book, I felt, was completely useless. It didn't do anything yeah, for was, me because the guys just chewed the stuff up so fast. It was, it was done. It was more about what the guys before you had done to that pair with the oil. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean... I don't know for people watching this is your legend so basically dark red that area of the lane slopes to the left dark blue everything slopes to the right and here i'll show you a couple pages uh let's look at lane 24. If memory serves me correct, um, uh, the yellow and the red is uh, down the left. middle, towards the middle. Yeah, sloping blue towards and the dark blue going to the right. Green is flat. There's not a lot of green. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> not, so that's 24, right? Let's yeah. go up to... I mean, this stuff would have been helpful if it, the oil was actually on the lane still oh boy so now you get into the middle of the house this is some of the you know the online tv shows you know that they were showing during qualifying stuff so I you can see down at the end on the left i mean if you yeah. see the end on the left that ball is trying to go into the gutter on the last six feet yeah and then here yeah. i'll show you uh 69 that was my that one made me giggle Where are you? 68 and oh yeah, here we go. This guy. <coughs> Let's see, we got the middle of the lane hooking in the heads. Yeah. Uh, Everything's going uh, to the left. Yeah. Now this topography would have made sense if the oil held up, but it never did. So when you're trying to play the lanes, you're trying to play maybe the back end, but if you couldn't get the ball through the fronts to get to the back end, it was it, it didn't matter. Yeah. It didn't matter. But yeah, so but I mean the topography would have helped. It really would have. But you know, all that surface on the lane just destroyed player. it. And this this book made no sense after that. Now maybe it made more sense in the matches, but qualifying it was useless. Here's the lane man of all lane man right here. Everybody knows how bad Everybody knows there are problems. Only a lane man knows how bad the problems really are. That yes, From Lenny. Lenny. Yes, Lenny. You guys know. And your you life know, would be uh, easier if you didn't have to deal with equipment all the time. Not to change subject, we we can come back to it. But but Lenny, uh, it, it, it was nice to see you there. Uh, if some of the people home uh, don't know this, you should know it. Uh, I you know. I'm not just the only one who advocates for the things that I do advocate for. The owner and CEO, the creator of Kegels, name's John Davis. R.I.P. Johnny. Yeah. Here's a guy. He he devoted his entire life to the sport of bowling, the sport of bowling. 
he had a passion about making this uh, the greatest sport in the world. And he went out on a limb. I think it was the, the year 2006. He finally said, look, it's out of my hands. You know, I know more than anybody about, about dressing lanes and try to keep them fair and do this, but it's out of my hands now. I can't, we can't, we're, our hands are tied. We're, we're having to make guesses just because of the way the lanes were changing. Yeah, the so oil was always changing the says, He said, the only, the only answer is we're going to have to come out with a game ball. That's it. Everybody the same ball. So here's a guy who was willing to sacrifice 80% of his oil business because he loved the sport. And that's what it would, have, it would have done. He would have lost 80% in his oil business because, he, you know, he'd go from 26 to 26 mils, 28 mils, 30 mils nowadays to, to seven. And I think you can even get down to six, five if we did a little R&D. But here, here it was. He, he was willing to give up 80% of his oil business because he loved the sport. And after he made that statement, it was probably a week later when all the backlash came, he had to abandon it that quick. The backlash from, from the industry, the ball industry, uh, he, he sells oil and it gets sold from distributors and distributors also sell bull and balls. There was a backlash. So he kind of had to abandon that idea. But he went on the limb, was willing to sacrifice a huge chunk of his business. Now, obviously, they sell machines, too, but he was willing to just because he loved the sport and he saw it as the only way well, to make and, it fair. Yeah, but, you know, what it sounds like, he saw the writing on the wall, too, which was basically he could only do so much, but eventually the bowling balls are going to get so big, it doesn't matter what he does. It, yeah. it, he's always going to be chasing, and that's what I had heard forever with the oil is that it, it was always chasing the bowling ball. It was always chasing. Oh, yeah. it. it wasn't the bowling ball trying to chase the oil. It was the opposite way. The oil was chasing the bowling ball. So you 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 always talk about the balls and the lanes and the oil. And mm -hmm. and Rob, we've talked about this one on one. There's one other thing that we haven't discussed yet that could be changed. And I know you have a big theory on this. It's the pins. Oh, absolutely. I mean, BB knows more, a little bit about my pins also and stuff. But it, I, I don't think Justin does. So why don't you fill everybody in on the pin theory that you have? Well, if we go through all the changes, and we've talked about the changes of the game, mainly a lot of it's the bowling balls and the oil. You know, lane surface changed, you know, went from wood to synthetics, this and that. But the one thing that hasn't changed is the pins. The pins have been the same since the 40s. They have not changed spec, parameters, nothing. Now, they're made differently, of course, but there's no change with them per se. With the problem I see with the oil patterns, and again, we come back to what the bowling balls do, which is destroy oil patterns, stuff like that. What it does is it kind of creates a separation of scoring paces amongst a group, an entire group of bowlers. The ones that figure it out can still average very high. I mean, you know, you can see the guy still average 270 on a block when you know down well the entire field's struggling a little bit. So it doesn't control the entire field as far as scoring pace. The only thing that wasn't ever touched was the pins. And the pins are still based upon 1940s regulations. The bowling balls aren't even the same. The angles, how the ball enters, the it's not even the same game. But the pins are never looked at because, number one, we want to knock them down. But two, if I can control the pin, which is ultimately the object of the entire game, I can control the scoring pace. And not just a majority or some. I can control everybody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require a lot outside of the fact of understanding where weights and heavy spots need to sit on pins in order to create desired pinfall. BV, I remember you used to talk about all the time, especially when I first joined on tour, pin voids, voids and pins. Yeah. They were never consistent. They're still not consistent. I've got pictures I shouldn't have of bowling pins, and there are different size voids. Some of them are as small as little batch books. Some of them are as big as that cup. And that would come out of the well, same just, box of pins. Some people may not understand, just to fill them in, if you put a hole in this pin down here, okay, it makes the top heavy. If it makes the top heavy, you hit it, and it's going to fall kind of easy. 
makes it if easier you put to fall. Lloyd up towards the yeah, top, don't have it. Bottom's heavy, then, then yeah. it doesn't fall as easy. Okay. I don't know what they're using now, but uh, I, I'm all with you. The only the only thing that I think, and and you you can talk about Smitty, is if if you make them too heavy, the machines we got nowadays that set them don't like them too heavy. So what, well, what's no, you can't make them too thing? heavy. And I've ruined a couple pin stops on our AS, you know, A twos that, you know, was the pins were too heavy. But I, I mean, I made three different sets of these. My first set, I drilled to the center of that pin. This is when I started really going, wow, there's different voids in these pins because I would just fill these things up with lead and some of them weighed four and a half, some of them weighed five and three quarters. It was like, whoa, there's nothing. They're like the hoinky like the hoinky pins you made basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Peterson. So yeah, the so, Peterson. Yeah. Yeah. So the second set I make, I just do the same thing. I drill to the center into the voids, but I only add a cubic inch of lead, which is close to a pound. Mm -hmm. It not it it created a little bit of a difference in hit because of the weight, but since the weight was still very high in the pin, they fell over kind of easy. So there wasn't a whole lot of difference between a regular pin and this pin that I made that was a pound heavier. Mm -hmm. Then my third set came out, and a lot of guys have bowled on it. Wesley Lowe bowled on it and absolutely loved it, and I swear I had so much fun watching them 5, 6, 10 every other shot on this stuff but all i did was i drilled in a specific distance into the pin on the bottom and filled it up with that pound plugged it up and then had that the entire scoring f pace of everybody dropped if i were to bowl a league on these oh, pins on my standard house shot if i averaged over 205 i would be ecstatic mm -hmm. my 220 guys some of the guys that throw it good they liked it. They could still average high 190s, 2.0. The ones that still averaged 220 but did not have a good ball roll, which means they were unfortunately a victim of what the bowling balls offer now, they dropped into a 170 bowler in a heartbeat because they didn't have the knowledge to understand how to get the ball to roll in to knock them down. Mm -hmm. It became much more of a spare shooting game, but I didn't take away the integrity of game of not allowing the player to still hit the pocket. They could still hit the pocket, but they knew that they had to roll it right to knock them all down. To me, the pins are the last frontier as far as anything goes. And, in, and again, you can control scoring pace by what kind of pins they are, where's the weight distribution. You can control this without making a mockery of everything where it's got to be this oil pattern and this bowling ball, and it, 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 you don't need it. You can just do it with the pins and be fine. Then what 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 was so wrong with the twister pins? Well, I know a lot of people hated the twisters when they came out. Weren't the twisters one entire mass of plastic? I, I don't know. I'm asking. I, I, I don't know the answer. I heard it heard it instruction. Like I just know how a, they fall. Like a Play-Doh tube or something. I mean, I I don't know. But the 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 pins were, I would say, not cured perfectly from one side to the other, and you just had to beat them up until you could deaden them to where they became normal all the way around. I believe Brian Himmler's uh, Bowling Center Cherry Grove down there, and since he still runs the original Twisters from 20 years ago. But they had to beat them up forever, but now the pins are great. They love them. So I see it. Justin, I see a couple questions in the chat, and I think you know what I'm going to what I'm gonna yeah, bring go, up. Yeah, go right ahead. There's a couple that I actually do want to bring up that have been brought up well, in the last five minutes. Well, the, I, since we're on the pin topic, there it is. That's on string. on string pin. That's it. If you're doing it for recreation, fine. If you're doing it for competition, no. That's it. That's all I got for you. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, between the file line and the head pin, uh, it's it's the same environment we've been talking about all day. You definitely have to uh, be flush more often. You don't get uh, messengers. You There are uh, some very peculiar ways that they fall down. Uh, I'm not I'm not sold on never any competition there. I, I maybe at the highest level. Uh, but other forms of competition, I'm not sold on saying I, I, I don't like them. I, I bowled on them. And, uh, you know, averages will come down, definitely. And there will be some uh, – uh, you won't see very many 710s made. Uh, uh, but I so you're okay. So okay. You'd, be, you'd be okay with, like, the recreational association tournament 
on strings, not the U.S. Open? Me, yes. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, a local level, just, you know, league, whatever. Yeah, fine. But, I mean, if you're going to talk about the competition and everything, no, no, that too many variables again, which is what we're, we're harping about right now. We're trying to eliminate all these variables that are in the game. Simplify it, you know, give it some standards so that way some people can actually comprehend and understand the physics, the mechanics of this game versus like, well, you know, this ball needs this layout and this layout on this. You don't even know why you want that layout. You just heard that it was good, so you said, let me do it. it, it you know, Mike, you know, the, um, with the number of bowling centers that appear to be closing, um, I firmly believe I'm a very optimistic man. I mean, we're going through some crazy, crazy things in the world, but but we're going to get through it all. And when we do, um, the cost of building a, a bowling center, there's going to be a lot of used lanes out there and, and certainly string machines uh, are a lot less expensive. There's mm-hmm. less maintenance on them. So that could be a, 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 a something that, that uh, may happen more, more in, in the future. And I, I'd be, I think I would be in support of it because it's, it's the same technique and the same things we're talking about. It's just the way that the pins fall. So yeah. I probably yeah. would, would embrace it, but certainly not for PBA. No. All right. Justin, what else you got here? I know you had a couple things you wanted to say. Yeah. So I want to bring up uh, this comment from Mason here. Rev rate, oh, hey, action, rotation, <laughs> tilt, speed, all have changed immensely over the years. The heavy pins are really fun to compete on. It requires entry, entry angle and a handshake between rev rate and speed. It was fascinating to bowl on them. Yeah, so, so Mason, think- one of uh, Mason Sherman's one of our Hall of Famers out here in Ventura County, and we had a little tournament out here one night, and enough guys wanted to ball on these heavy pins. Um, so I put them out, and it was all the good players. We're bowling on, you know, we're bowling on the burn squad. I think it was cheetah pattern or something, but either way, we're bowling on it. And I hadn't seen fourteen grown men have more fun shooting one seventies. <laughs> and leaving five pins and be, because they all knew that if the ball was rolling dead oh yeah they knew it they, they, they didn't even question that they didn't strike because they knew it they saw it and it was to them it, they liked the challenge of having to try to actually make the ball shape and roll and manipulate exactly right to knock them down if you had a good ball roll you can get away with some lighter half pocket hits once in a while but not all the time Again, Mason, I mean, he's a Hall of Famer out in my area. He knows how to bowl. I mean, he had a blast. We had a wonderful time just bowling on these pins because everybody got squashed down. I think the high game out of all of us was maybe 215, 220 on an easy shot. And there was yeah. 14 of us. So the, the next question that I want to ask, follow up to that, would the lower scoring affect the viewership at the highest level? That's a I don't one. think it would be lower scoring because honestly, if I can control the pace with the pins, that means I don't have to make the lanes quite as obnoxious or make them hard for the general bowler to understand. So, you know, if I can make the pins hard enough to where it requires precision to get to the pins and knock them down, instead of if it just gets close to the pins, they all fall down, but you just play the lane. I mean, I don't think you'll see as many buck fifties as you would think. I don't yeah. think you'll see as many two forties either, but you won't see as many buck fifties, which would mean now all the games are more competitive. They're closer, which creates more excitement. I would think. Do you, do you think that I kind of just lost my train of thought here. <laughs> um, uh, while you're getting your train of thought, view I, I got it. I got it. Okay. So do Go you think, it. You just cut off a Hall of Famer, Justin. Excellent. He's probably cut off a Hall of Famer before, too, so I don't think it's his first rodeo. Do you think that the heavier pins would have a sep- more of a separation between your high, your the, the best play in your league at your center and the best in the world? So where when you watch bowling on TV, 240 isn't very common at your home center. And now they're, they're you're seeing guys on TV. Do you think that separation would start to happen on the professional level? I think, I mean, if you're talking just sheer scoring pace, you know, you're going to have some guys that will know how to 
bull well on it per se. If I'm trying to understand what you're saying on it is, yes, the better bullers will always figure out what to do. Brian will figure out what to do. Your dad would figure out what to do. I mean, there's no question on this. But what it would entail is probably somebody has a little more patience. You know, if you get the right angle to knock down the pins and strike, that's great. But if you lose the angle, you're still hitting the pocket. But if you don't have the right angle, now you're not striking. You have to start manipulating, which kind of turns in more of having to do tricks and things like that back when the bowling balls were less, you know, aggressive per se. But you now you're starting to fiddle with it to try to control angles. So if you lose the angle spot, you're not you're not making a mockery of it by all of a sudden the guys start missing the pocket and they look like they can't hit anything. They're still right. in the pocket, but then they have to figure out how to control the carry. How do I get into this position? And I think with just the heavier pins, not even saying heavier, but just getting the weight lower to where they're harder to fall down, I think it would just it would make it a little simpler for people to understand how one person carries this way while another person can't carry that way. You know, again, simplifying it, but making it more understandable for everybody. And it's not going to be for everyone. The pins should not be for everybody. Right. Heavier pins, loaded pins on the bottom should be for the higher end players, the ones that want a struggle. A you know a a competition not only against others but amongst themselves to try to knock these things down, which are now much harder to do. Yeah. So that kind of your answer kind of leads me into this next question. So ABA, AFL, and WHA formed competitive leagues with creative minds to successfully provide alternate entertainment to status quo NBA, NFL, and NHL. Is it? There's a captive audience for a new brand of elite competition. It doesn't have to be a complete industry train change, rather a new offering to even better than sport bowling. So do you think that even a, a different per se league, something separate, separate from the PBA that offered these heavier pins that wouldn't be a complete worldwide industry change, but would make the, sport of bowling more fair i think it would give it a different option i mean and that's i mean that's what i really want just an option and let the let the bowlers figure it out and understand i mean brian's probably got a, a concept about this too but i mean with where it is right now i mean you know people want these big scores but you know they don't understand the nuances so when they do the little ones you know it's always the ball it's the lane it's never me but Brian, what do you think on it? Uh, I, I tend to lean towards. Uh, I, I think it's it's how heavy you're you're talking about going from three eight to maybe three twelve with. Uh, well, three twelve would be the gold pins. Three twelve would be the gold pins because the gold pins, all they were, were just the high end of what a legal pin was. So it was three pounds, wow. twelve ounces. So all, all those that want to know what a gold pin was, that's and what exactly were the voids in those gold pin? Do you do the recall? same as they were on the regular ones? We don't know. Okay, we don't know. They're they probably buried. I would assume. They I think it would it would eliminate uh, more lucky strikes. Uh, rolling two pins for us right-handers drives people nuts. Oh, that was the cool thing with my uh, pins. No lucky strikes, and I eliminated the two eight ten. How do you define a lucky strike? Is a messenger a lucky strike, or is that uh, pretty much they count on that nowadays? Uh, That's a pretty uh, common it's, shot now. It's, it's a common, common shot. You expect it, you know? Yeah, yeah a lot more people get eliminate it that. And then if you, you don't throw the pen uh, pin across the deck, you're turning the bowling ball. Well, a the messenger ball's is, is a flat 10. A messenger is a flat 10, let's be honest. It's all you, it is. The flat 10 with the pin flying over but you were throwing messengers 30 years ago when nobody else did. Well, yeah. that was because I had 19 mile hour ball speed with a 550 rev rate. And once in a while, I, if I touch the head, then I can animal. make them a little bit. An animal. So, so yeah, I, I am in favor of that. I am in favor of that, but, but, but to use them strictly only for the, the highest, uh, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Well, I mean, think of the I'd pins like a red, white, and a blue spot you know, tee box and use the pins to control scoring pace to allow what you should be. So if you have one set of pins that are a little lighter or maybe easier to fall down, this is the scoring pace. You can handicap the scoring pace of pins. You can't handicap the scoring pace of lanes because one, they don't want that. 
But if I bring in a set of pins that say, this is the handicap these pins offer, okay, bowling proprietors may not be so, you know, don't want to say shitty about it, but, you know, no bowling proprietor would love to have their bowling center considered to be a tougher bowling center in the area. They all want to be easy. So, I mean, our place, Justin, where we bowl at. Right. So let's so, just make them easy and then give them a simpler option to make them harder and, you know, use the pins to handicap. I think it's simple. The game again, though, I mean, you're not going to label for everybody. I mean, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put these pins in a, in a senior league at 1 p.m. I'm not going to put those pins in there. Right. You know, the poor people throw it 10, 11 miles an hour. They're not going to knock them down. They're going to stay with the standard pins or, or even a lighter one. Who knows? Yeah, you, 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 you know, you have to kind of uh, think how a proprietor thinks. Uh, does he want a whole new set of pins uh, waiting, um, you know, in, in the back uh, while he's got all these other pins up here? Uh, could it be done in such a way that they were rotated f with uh, agreements from one bowling center to another? I, I, I don't know that. Oh, I, well, in order for me to find somebody to make these pins, there's only two. And right now, one of them, I know when I tried to talk to him, won't drop names. He gave me every other reason why, but the bowling pin. So, so I got to know where that stands right now. But, you know, if anybody out there is listening and wants to make some pins and control scoring pace, try it. So I want to touch on a new one. We haven't, we haven't talked on this one tonight. And, Justin, it's one of the questions that I normally ask everybody. And this is for Brian, and I, I know he's been a little outspoken on this too. So, Brian, I normally ask people this question: Who is, who's more, who's revolutionized the game more, Roth or Belmonte, and why? And leading into that, because of the two-handed, so your thoughts on that as well. Uh, Robert, okay. Robert, cringing. Here we go. Uh, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Mark Roth. And the reason is, well, one obvious reason is, is because we all did it with one hand. Okay. Let's just be honest. We all did it with one hand and I, I'm not going to, I don't like to use, uh, we're going to get into this. I'm sure I don't like to use the word revolutionize with, with Jason. Okay. Because the revolution isn't complete yet. It's in the initial phase of, of revolution. Fair point. Um, it's always advancing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is It is advancing. And um, he is on target to, and I still don't want to say revolution. I, I want to say change. Uh, Walter? Uh, resin. I'm not going to say nothing else. <laughs> uh, it, yeah. If you asked me, if you would have asked me five years ago who revolutionized the game more, Roth or Belmo, I would have said Roth. Because Roth made it cool to try to hook it. I mean, you know, everybody wanted to hook it. So, you know, when I went and started practicing as a kid, I tried to emulate Roth, you know, step as hard as I could, wrench on it for everything I had, you know. But when you're talking about, you know, like you said, revolution, you don't want to say the word, but Belmo, oh my gosh. 70% of my bowlers out here are two-handed or no thumb. I can't fight it. Especially everybody under 30, I can't fight it. Open play bowlers. League guys transforming, Justin. I know you're one of them that went from a one to a two-hander. You were too for a while. I, I tinkered with it. I had to learn it, and it didn't hurt my back. So what the hell? I figured I could make a mockery of things worse than this. So, you know, but, you know, it, it, there's it's hard. Oh, my God, is it hard. It's not the same mechanics. It's not the same motions. Um, so do you think that's going to hold the test of time and, and – like, look at Walter. Walter. Yeah, I think it's done. I think it's already converted. I but what I mean is, converted. do you think, like, like look at Walter and Duke, right? Duke is still competitive at almost age 60 with the kids. He's he's a test of time. Yeah, One-handed traditional. 
Yeah, you're still going to have your traditionalists, your thumb hands, your straighter players. You know. What I'm saying is, will the two-handers, do you think, are they going to be competitive when they're in their 50s, late 50s, early 60s? Or... I think so. I think really? So. Yeah. Yeah, I, think it's, I don't think it's as taxing on the body as people think it is. I really don't think it's as taxing. I think you don't when you have do this wide right, opening right? of your shoulders. You don't have the back tilted forward. Um, you know, yeah, they lean forward a lot, but they lean a lot with their waist and hip. It's not with their back and you know knees. Um, I yeah, I think I think the two handed play is going to be around a long time. I mean, you know, and the ones that you know the ones that throw good, I think they they're going to do it for a long time. I really do. I could see Bill Mobile and well into you know, 50s, 60s without any issues. I, I think like with, with anything we do, and I'm going to use weightlifting as a comparison. When we do things the wrong way and use the wrong muscles to create power, that's when we get injured, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When you, in, in whatever you're doing, in, in weightlifting, lift, lifting, if you use the wrong part of your body to lift something up, you're going to pull a muscle. In bowling, if you're using the right muscles in the right way, you're not going to get hurt. Oh, unless I definitely some, agree with that. Unless some freak accident happens. So when these most of the one hand, the best one-handed players use their core and their legs to generate all their power. Yeah. Two hands. If you look, if you look at mine with one-handed, I definitely generated more with the legs, but I also used the hip. I would throw my hip forward a lot, and I think that's probably ultimately what cost me bowling for a while. Yeah, and I mean, when you look at a lot of these guys that are bowling two-handed that are bowling really well, their their power is not coming from their upper body. No, it's coming it's coming from their lower body, and I'm using this from experience because I've I've done it too. I know that the power always I, came from the legs. It's just now with with the ability to compact everything and keep everything centralize you can get a lot lower get the legs a lot more involved because your balance isn't falling all over the place right the the difference in power and rev rate is just because of your hand getting in a different spot it's not because you're you're doing more to the ball that but also there's less restriction too so i mean you know two-handers if you do it right you are in maximum position for rev rate and that is right. a position i cannot get to with my thumb in the ball Right. There's no way for me to get to that position. Jacob's the only one that gets kind of close, but that that looks like it hurts. Yeah, that's that's a freak of nature. Yeah, that's, that's for another day. But you know, so you know, there are advantages to having a no thumb in there because you can cup the wrist more. So that means when you get the roll off your hand, you're generating the maximum amount that your hand can get. Okay, a couple of things. <laughs> I'll jump in on this here real quick. Yeah. I'm glad I, I, I've I've heard. I, I don't think there's enough um, um, uh, stats out there yet to determine the lifespan of a of a two hander. Do I think that, that they will last? Do you do will they last as long as one handers? Uh, I don't know that. Do I think they will? No, I don't. Uh, how much longer? Who knows? But here is my issue when when we talk about two handed bowling. Here here is my issue. If in earlier in the show. I was talking about you, you have to be able to look into the future, uh, have some kind of vision and be able to project where we're going to be in 10 years. Where were we 10 years ago with two handers? What was the percentage of, of and I'm just going to really. There's only focus. two of them. <laughs> There's only two. Yeah. This is their generation. And. And, uh, you know, we screwed up. We screwed our generation up. We put it in your hands, but here's where we're at. How many were there five years ago? More. How many two years ago? More. How many last year? More. And how many this year? More. And it's going to continue like that. Because when you talk about these kids and you've got all of them doing at a very young age, they get, number one, the traditional kids have got no chance. No chance against them between the age and six to 12. The, the, no, especially no. on the soft shot. No chance. And so as each year goes by, there's going to be more of them and more of them. And that means less and less of one handers. And when you take the, the, these eras and you keep fast forwarding it in 10 years, it's all going to be two handed bowling competitively. Because I would, I would say it's going to be well over 90, 95% in 10 years. Absolutely. Kids, 
if if you if if those are the projections that you that you anticipate are going to happen, then you say, okay, what's going to happen to the rest of the bowlers that still exist? I'm talking about the teenage or the the twenties, thirties, all the old goats that still believe that a simple rule change would have all prevented this chaos that we're in. So if in 10 years you're going to see, you're not going to see any more one-handed bowling, you, you won't see it. Is that a good thing? And how long, how many generations will it take to accumulate the millions of bowlers right now that already exist doing it one with, with one hand? Are you willing to go through that transition where, where you're, you're, you're going to lose the interest from these millions that have been doing it forever? Sure, maybe in uh, 20 or 30 years when uh, the, you know, the entire population is doing it, um, but, but that's a serious problem, and, and, and you've, you've got to anticipate that that's the way it's going to be. I mean, I'll probably be dead in 10 years. I hope not. Uh, oh, stop, but, stop. <laughs> I'll be 75. I hope I make it that long. But you you, you, you kids in your, this generation, we've handed you some, some, some problems, and you're going to have to figure them out. And that is going to be one of them. And you need to anticipate that one-handed bowling. If what it, what it's gonna, then you're all gonna be bowling against you, you, yourselves. You won't have all these one-handers to beat. And if you statistically look at what's going on, if you're a good two-hander, you, you got a better chance against the one-handers. Well, now, and if you think about it, bowling against as many other two-handers. But when they're all two-handers, you think lanes break down quick now? Jeez, you're gonna be but then, lost. In, that was the thing. I mean, over but but that then was how, the thing. I bowled the tournament, and eighty percent of the guys throw it like I did, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, everybody's on this side, so there's nowhere to go. But, yeah, but Rob, how, this, this is important. But Rob, here. how is how is Duke able to compete? Because Duke throws amazing shots and he can stay outside of everybody's ball track. I mean, let's be honest, all the two-handers, how many two-handers you know can play straight up a board? And do not it, even do straight, it. right to just, left. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking straight up as in right belling at three or four boards. I'm talking straight up. Yeah. I don't know any two-handers that can do that. He's Norm, uh, you know, and Norm, he's Norm's a, a different animal. We know that. All day. He's got. I, I've got his film on camera. I, him and I practice together, and it is unbelievable when you watch the Norm? perfection in his swing. Yeah, Norm it's can great. go to a spot on the lane and just find a little niche all by his lonesome, and he can just park there all day, and nobody will mess with him. And when you're talking about this era, and how again with the Masters, how the breakdown and all the two handers and everybody came in, and they're all left of middle arrow and this and that. And here's Norm all by him, some so outside playing second arrow. Nobody's He's messing with his first 20, 30 feet. It's all gravy. That yes. tournament set up nicely for Norm. It really did. You get on some softer stuff where you can let the two handers stay a little bit longer to the right. That's a whole different demon now. But even like when you bowl in the U.S. Open, like when you get to the fifth, sixth arrow, when Belmo can get in there and the two handers get in there, it's almost impossible to beat them, right? Or like the, in the longer formats. Yeah, so the longer just, formats. But the same thing yeah. with Duke is always competitive in those two. Like he's he's just seen it all. Like is he just that much more knowledgeable than these guys? Like he knows how to bowl, and yeah. these guys don't. Well, I mean, bad, was, no, no disrespect. Old, right? What's he's that? Been doing it since he was two years old. If I'm not mistaken, he, he started out when he was – he could hardly walk. <laughs> I, mean, he, I think he started at a really early age. Uh, I mean, he's a complete student of the game, and not just the game itself, his game. He's a student of his game. How hard the steps hit the approach, how quick he's on him, how quick he's off him. You know, where's his weight? Is he leaning forward, back? You know, he, he is a complete student of every aspect of his game. And the guy with that good a touch who has total control over his physical ability, he doesn't care where he's playing. He's going to throw it, and he's just going to throw better shots than you. And that's what so then, does. So you just said throw better shots. And here's a question for the both of you. And, and Brian, you're one of the greatest shot makers I've ever seen in my life. I mean, that year I bowled the Open with you, on that garbage at one-to-one -one at Carolier, you were like an artist. It was unbelievable to watch you just throw shots. 
Well, is the you. shot made? You're very welcome, and thank you for that beer, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, behind that. Go ahead. yeah, there is a story yeah. behind that, folks. Um, mm -hmm. Is the shot maker gone? Like back in your time, you, Walter Parker, um, Ferraro, you naming guys like that. You guys were shot makers. Mm -hmm. Is there a shot maker now, or is a shot maker kind of obsolete? Like, have they gone beyond, you know, like they... You can classify the really good two-handers as shot makers. I mean, Simo, I, I Simo shots at the Masters beat Norm. I mean, that was that was shot making. I, I, I understand the, 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 what he's saying. Um, uh, in order to be a good shot maker uh, in, in our sport, I, I think uh, it's in my opinion, that there's more going on. Uh, backswings are over your head. The tendency for a ball to be left or right or, or where it should be um, is, is harder to maintain than when we're holding it with two hands and swinging it. It's very compact. You don't really see uh, uh, two-handers where a ball uh, is starting here and then going over here and then they're throwing out there. It's very compact. It's a lot in my opinion, it's a lot easier to to almost be more accurate. Yeah, it's really. a much more compact swing. It's a cradle. It's I mean, it doesn't ever exit outside of your balance of your body. So, yeah. And they never grab it. It's impossible for them to grab one. Yeah. Well, so when's I, the last time your thumb stuck? Well, that's what I was going to say to you. Like The, the, the thumb doesn't <laughs> hang up in it, but I can <laughs> grab it. There, there is the ones with the no. elbow gets involved, and that's grabbing it. <laughs> you, but you'll, you'll never, it. you'll never squeeze one when you need it, though. That's the, that's the point. Yeah, the I'll give you um, uh, sweating. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'll give you a quick little, which, which is rel, which is relative to what we're talking about. Uh, a little story about Mike Miller. Okay, love Mike Miller. One of the funniest guys you'll oh, ever God. meet. Great yeah, guys. Those stories sure. are for another day. Mike was, uh, you know, uh, in the 80s, uh, we were touring and he was out there and, and uh, you know, he was a mediocre player, had a real nice swing and just didn't have the hand. And then uh, Mike went home and God bless his heart. And, and this guy went home and just said, you know, what? I'm going to learn how to bowl without a thumb. And he came out six months later and all of a sudden he's a threat. Goes on to shoot 300 on national TV, doubles in the tenth to beat Norm in the PBA national. I, I forget which year. Killing the ball off of every which way on the lane. And and it was me once again. Me, I went to the tournament committee, and I kind of saw what uh, in in ten or fifteen or twenty years what was going to go on, and uh, I recommended a rule: you got to put your thumb in there. And my reasoning was: here I am. And I, I love Mike. I mean, he knows the whole story. He's we're, or we're cool, we're buddies, and all that. But I, I, I let him know. You know, here I've been bowling my entire life with a thumb, and I've had to learn some things. And now I watch you go home, and you do this without a thumb. And all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're superstar status. And and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like, I didn't like the fact that you could get that yeah, much better. The from being mediocre right, but to didn't, but you can't knock him for finding a better way to throw the ball. Oh hell no! I a, I and he didn't do it with him. equipment. He did it with his physical talent. That's right. That's why the two handed doesn't bother me either because it's just a physically better way to throw the ball. I threw it the way I did I because it was disagree. physically better. It, it, it's just the progression again, and, and that's where it is. I mean, it's you just going to get to the point. It's just the, the in, in my. I'm going to say it one more time. My, you, you have to anticipate where you're going to be at in 10 years. And if it's going to be all two-handed, which eventually it's going to be because these kids that are doing 6 and 12, they're going to age 16 to 22. They're going to be in college. Um, what are you going to do with the one-handed bowlers? Well, are, are you going to give them a separate category, or are you just going to let them fade well, this off? This is where I think it circles back to equipment i think it circles back to equipment because let's be honest these kids that grew up no thumbs two-handed every oh, bowling yeah. ball that's on the market is designed to do what yeah. hook hook and yeah. they all say it hooks they don't even say oh it strikes they just all say it hooks 
the bowling balls that were marketed back in the day, as you know, let's say even before your thing, were they, they get more strikes with this ball, get more strikes, you will get more strikes. But as the progression of bowling balls came along, it was always hook more and more hook, more hook, more hook, more hook. Well, what's the best way to throw a bowling ball when you have equipment that is meant to be hooked, two handed? It's the best way to throw it, and it's because of the equipment. If you make the equipment not so forgiving and wanting to hook and make all of them throw plastic balls and stuff, I'm pretty sure the two-handers might go away a little bit because they won't be accurate. I, I think it's just a byproduct of the equipment and what the equipment has been able to offer, and if they're wanting them to hook, somebody found a better way to throw the ball to make them hook, and if we still keep the equipment as so hook-based – Somebody's going to come along and find a way to throw it even better. They'll probably kick the ball after they throw it with their two hand. I don't know, but they're going to find something, but it, it, it still stems back to the equipment because that's what the equipment equipment pushes. Then here's and that's why equipment. I think the two hand, it's going to stay because of the equipment. Then here's another equipment question. Why is it now that if you're left-handed, it's a purple ball, it's urethane only. You rarely see lefties on the show throw anything but urethane. Like why? Why is it always urethane on that side of the lane? Like wh- why is it? Why is the urethane revolution come back? You know, like it was dead in the in the two thousand. You never heard of it, and then all of a sudden it just boom! It came out of nowhere again. Why? I can't answer that. I don't know. I'm not Please. on their side. I I, I, I don't know. I, I have to think that the the only ones that are successful doing that are the high rev players, the two handers, and and. Uh, Mr. Boutroff, he's a very unique, unique kind of player. Boy, I tell you what, I, I, he can <laughs> Have strike. Have you ever it. seen anybody like him, Brian, in all your no. years? Have you ever seen anybody like no. that? Let me think. No. <laughs> no, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. You know, you, you have some – okay, uh, – if this isn't even close, but Ron Williams uh, back in the days he used to kind of bring that ball up like this and swing it off to the side, side and dip. You know, he was the king of the hill, king of the hill uh, bowler that won for a while. You know, that was very unique. But but to the extent that that what he does, it hurts. The where his hand is in the backswing, it hurts just looking at it. What about Mike? Mike Lickstein's another one. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, good old Mike. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. That, that was nothing but smooth on that form. Yeah. But I can't. I, I I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. I don't. Interesting. It really. There should never be an asterisk after somebody wins a tournament that you, you know uh, an invisible asterisk. Well, I was left-handed, or, or um, you know, you had to loft the six. There should never be an asterisk there. And it, 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 it's a shame that the lefties will always hear this too. Well, you had it yeah. this week. They gave it to you. You know, and and yeah. and Justin, Dad's said this to me numerous times. You know, he's always heard, "Well, you had it this week, so there, that's why you won." It, why does it never? Let, they never get yeah. credit for making no. good shots for forty-two games. And it's it's never, and and this has gotten me pretty heated over the past couple of weeks. It's never that somebody bowls good anymore. They yeah. they got right. they had the they had the latest ball, so they bowled eight forty. Um, they were left-handed and were throwing urethane, so they were able to break the five-game SYC record because they were left-handed and throwing a purple hammer. Oh, just, say, uh, just, just say the, your brother. Uh, who's the four-man team yeah. that just broke the record? Oh, God, they bowled, a, they bowled a ton last night. Right. What did they shoot, 32-60? Yeah, 32-60. Four-man team, 32-60, BV. How's that? Phenomenal bowling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's eight fifteen. Man, four guys bowling on three games. They probably <laughs> shot ten spares. Yeah. yeah, and they probably yeah. And and I mean now probably had a good time. Yeah, <laughs> hope they won some side pods. Jeez. Yeah. I, I, how can we get rid of putting that? asterisks up there? It goes back to to what we're playing on. How how can we how can we get this environment so? It's fair for anybody at any time. And at any time, it's always fair. Yeah. That's it. Right. I mean, that's the name. How do we make it fair for anybody? I mean, that's, that's the ultimate yeah. thing on this whole thing. I mean, that's all any of us ever wanted, Justin. I know that's the way you wanted to. You just want fair. What, what's the yeah. fairest way? So, you know, Justin, do we take the corner pins out? I don't know. I mean, you know, right. <laughs> what do you do? 
So, Justin, I got two more, and we'll okay. wrap it up. So, guys, both of you, how do you bring competitive bowling back now? How do you make it better? Yeah, how do you make it better? It's, it's, it's broken. And the future. First off, I think you've got to make the players bigger than the ball company. And Love let's be honest, idea. everything is the ball company and not the player. Belmo's the only one that is bigger than the ball company, and that's by a little bit. You know, probably biting off my head on this one. But, yeah, I mean, it's gotten to the point where it's, you know, storm this, storm that, Brunswick this, Evernight this. Motor- what about who the player? Who won? You know, and it seems like the bowling balls get more pushed than the players do. And, I, you know, if you want to get more interest in it, you got to make the players more – you got to make it more important than the equipment. And with the way that, again, we're just beating a dead horse on this, the equipment – it's so important with today's game that it is. It's bigger than the bigger than the player. Brian, uh, I'm 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 going back to everything that I've talked about. We've got to get this uh, the playing environment uh, stabilized. Um, it's I just don't see any other way. It's got to get stabilized, and you know when when. Uh, you can take uh, a skill ball or a plastic ball or even uh, a three dot or a black diamond. Right now, you could still wall them up so you could you could average 230. Right now, you could do it. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people back home, you know, when they hear, oh, you're going backwards to this or that and it's going to lower the scores. No, no, you're going to have to work a little bit hard of it and you might have to learn how to, you know, a little bit more hand action. But we I mean, want to. You want to have fun? Shoot, give you a twenty-one and a Christmas twenty to one. There's enough ratio. oil patterns now. We can find the biggest we'll ball that. that anybody wants to see with oil patterns and still use less equipment. That's not the problem. Yeah, but I, mean, I, I want to get it. I, I, I'd love for it to be again where we're okay. We've we've got professionals, sixty exempt or, or whatever. We, we've got some regional players, this and then. We've got other people traveling around bowling terms. I'd love to be able to. All four guys can get in one SUV, put their put their balls in one SUV, and take off. That was my That's junior great. days. I'm serious. That was, that was my I'll black night, my pearl blue hammer, and off we went. And the pain in the butt of all of those things. It's not necessary to find out who's the best. It's not necessary. It's the way it is now. You have to do it. You have to have all those balls. But yeah. it's not necessary to determine the best. Yeah, especially after the Masters when I showed up there with nine and had three of them yanked out of my bag after day one. But that's for another day. <laughs> that's for another topic, uh, there, buddy. Yeah, so for, yeah that's, that's for a whole another day yeah. on that. That's so then point. I got two more, Justin, and these are for Brian. These would be really, really quick okay. ones. So, Brian, you just said, you know, about the equipment and whatnot. So uh-huh. what Brian Voss was tougher on tour, the urethane Voss or the resin Voss, and why? Oh, I think uh, the urethane, and and the reason I say the reason well, I say that is you weren't affected by by resin. Like how how many titles did you have with urethane? Like, I had what was, the, what was the splits? Like what was the split? Like what? Did, how many did you win with urethane to resin? I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna say it's it's, it's close. So like half, like twelve and twelve, basically. Close. I'm gonna okay. say it's close. I'm gonna say no. I'm, I'm sure somebody on here can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, but but I think I was more of a threat with with urethane because I could do more things with my hand than, than other people could. Okay, uh, I could create a way to let go of of a ball sometimes that that would would uh, uh, and that stems really you know from I was seven years old till I was seventeen I threw a baseball little league Babe Ruth American Legion taking that ball making it talk doing a lot of things. And that's always the way that I've approached a uh, uh, bowling. So uh, when, during the urethane days, you were allowed to be more creative. Um, and the guys didn't have the luxury of drilling all these balls to keep up with you if you were creative. Uh, I but, mean, a hand trick to move two boards was huge back in the day. Now, you know, a hand trick can make the ball dance 12 boards more. It, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm going to go back to another question that, one of our favorites, Justin, Charlie Tapp asked. This is for Brian. Okay. And Charlie Tapp. Who benefited the most from urethane? Not from resin, from urethane. 
Ooh. What kind of the most from urethane? And it never, and we never heard that one. We always hear who, who was affected more with resin, never affected with urethane. That's a good one from Charlie Tapp. Oh, I would uh, employ a little bit of speculation here, but I'm going to say uh, um, softer speed guys who could circle the boards, you know, like uh, like Ballard and, and Chris Warren. M. Leto. Um, M. Leto rolled it out. He rolled a lot out with your thing. Well, yeah, M. he could make it roll really, out with the best M. Leto of my thing. <laughs> M. Leto didn't really peak uh, during the the uh, urethane eras. He he peaked a little bit after. M. Leto's great because of his his work ethics and and uh, his all the hard work he did for for physical training. He was just a blessed athlete. But Charlie Tapp, uh, that's the best I could do for you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so Justin, I'm going to ask Brian my famous one that I ask everybody. And I go ahead, Rob. I've asked I've asked this one to you. So so Brian. Who was the best guy on tour that never went to the winner's circle? Rich Wall. <laughs> Justin, it's every that was single no doubter. person. No it, doubter. It's unbelievable. Everybody Rich, says if it. you're listening to this, sorry, but yes, you are the best one to never win. Everybody says it. It's unbelievable. No, no doubt about it. Form yeah. technique. He just, a, just, he just had a technique that says how uh, how, how could he not have won? It's, it was fabulous, beautiful technique. Well, he never fell off balance. His ball yeah. roll looked the same every time. It just couldn't Man. catch a break, so got his own way. Who nice knows? Guy. But, yeah. Nice guy, too. Wolf. So, guys, <laughs> this has been awesome. So, how about we give you guys the floor? Rob, Brian, what would you guys say to the guys out there? To, how can we save bowling and make it better? One last thing. What, what can we do? Your, your final thoughts of your the, final thoughts on the night, the great show we've had tonight. Well, my, my, my final thoughts is, is just really to soak up every bit of information that you heard tonight. And, and it's, it, it's going to be up to your generation uh, to figure it out. I, I don't have all the answers. I, I, I wish I did, but I, I believe that some of the answers uh, you've heard tonight, uh, maybe not to the degree, the degree that I'm saying, uh, but don't let, uh, I don't want to say this the wrong way. Don't You're going let, to. <laughs> don't let the enforcers of this industry, uh, uh, have so much say in how this game is played. The players really should be the ones who determine collectively how, how you should. I mean, play. we're going to be the most fair for each other on that. Yeah. But 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 there needs to be some communication uh, with with the, the the young kids and present them the the, the problems the, the the projections and and don't rely on authority and leadership the overseers the protectors of integrity because they failed us the leaders of the sport and I'm not going to say the name but the no. leader the guy who's captaining the ship is he the right captain for competitive bowling right now not if his thinking is the same no i think he needs to think out of the box rob I think I, he bowls we know he did i bowled with him yep. very USA. competitive very competitively too very good he knows the game inside and out mm -hmm. fairness what you know and again this is the question we all want we want fairness and right now with every avenue aspect of the game the i mean the bowling balls the nonsense of yanking them out in the middle of the masters all of a sudden you can't use certain stuff for nationals that but the local level you can the pba says okay you can use these balls but you can't use these ones and then if these are too old then those are out of play too but we're not necessarily following anything you i mean it's so out of control. Nobody's on the same page anymore. Mike, we talked about the other night, USBC or uh, Hall of Fame, State Hall of Fames between Jersey and California, right? By the way, did you know that Walter Ray Williams is not in the California Bowling Hall of Fame? He's and not. He has, and right now, based upon the rules, he has no chance. You know, basically, you need to, what is it? Uh, 
15 years of state USBC membership, which I'm sure he did from a kid all the way through. So 15 years in California, 12 mm -hmm. years of bowling the state tournament, which if you understand California, it's a big state. You're not bowling state every year. And you had to have won either one of the events for state or the masters or the Queens. That's it. So and if you don't bowl them, you can't get in. Of course, that's California. Who, who would expect? Yeah, I know. Yes. Yeah, I know it is California. You know, and, and New Jersey, and I and I gave you the example in New Jersey what they're trying to pull with. Yeah, here. you get the point here, and honor scores matter, and this and tournament. I mean, it's like that's not even the same. The requirements that are they're not even the same for ABC or for USBC. So even on that petty of an issue of hall of fame and how do you get inducted and stuff even that's different so yeah right now we we are so fragmented that if anything's going to get done pba ball companies usbc they need to get their act together and, and get to some sort of common ground because Robert, I mean, we, I get, um, Robert, we, we, hats oh. off to you too i know you you you, you got to go Hats off to you guys. You got to keep having these conversations with with people and and keep doing. Thank you, Fancy. Thank you, and, Fancy. And, and <laughs> get this, get these collective ideas all together, and and uh, just keep doing what you're doing, and and uh, you know that's all we we can do. That's Brian, we I thank do. you, and we would love to have you back at a later time if you want to sit and come back and BS with us again. Um, this was this was an awesome two hours. Yeah, this, a lot was, of, a, this a lot. was really good. Well, I don't think you two have ever been this quiet, have you? No, no. no. <laughs> the, the, the past couple of weeks, it's it's been the, just the two of us, and we were able to have a, a great, educated discussion without really crossing a line, I feel. Um, yeah. And it was all in the fairness and all for the game that we all love all, and have, has given our entire life to. All we yep. want to do is see this game thrive. And yeah. Keep going I want to see the next forward. generation make millions, but you know, right now with yeah, where the game is and no, no leadership and unity, forget it. There's no way. There's and, and absolutely thank, no way. And thank you for Fancy for correcting us there, Robert. Yeah, thank you, Fancy. And, and really quick, it, it, we're talking about Walter not being in the California State Hall of Fame. Um, Brian, just really quick, touching on the Hall of Fame. Tim Mack is not eligible for the New Jersey State Hall of Fame either. And to me, that's just an, that's an insult. Robert, we talked about this. Yeah, this and, is where that conversation stemmed from. It's just Timmy doesn't have the, the requirements to get into the Jersey Hall of Fame. He was too busy bowling everywhere else but Jersey. Yeah. And you know, you're the, and, oh, yeah. is he? Really? Oh, sorry. Un Uncle State Doug. Either. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Doug. Maybe no, the players not, do not have him. to take control of this, Brian. Maybe we just do. I think, really quick, I think it's more guys like Brian – Robert, you, Barnes, Parker, guys that have a ridiculous resume and the name is really credited in the sport. You are the guys that need to stand up and be vocal, whether it's on social media or in an event. Your words will get through the powers that be more than mine, more than Justin's, more than, you know, the, the 217 league guy. That's that's where it has to start from, I think. Uh, we, we're here to try to get the 217 league guy to yep. understand the game a little bit better, understand where they're at, why they are where they're at, not just, oh, you know, this ball did this for me today or whatever. You know, there's so much more to this game than what's available. And, you know, if people can learn it, understand it, trust that they will never master this game, but, boy, you can learn the hell out of it. You know, yeah, I think – the better the education gets even amongst the regular bowling population, I think you'll get changes at the local levels, which is really where it needs to start. It needs to be at the local levels and start pushing there and then having the local levels, you know, kind of force the hands of the upper, you know, the upper people to, to do it right. Yeah, guys. All right. Brian, Robert, a hell of a discussion. thank you very much. And like I said, Brian, we'd love to have you back at a later time. Thanks and, for having um, us. Thank you very much. It was an awesome two hours. Rob, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, we'll talk for sure. Justin, have a good trip out there, okay, bud? Yeah, Justin, thank you, guys. Good to see you. Nice BB, I'm going to see you in a Mike. month. Yeah. I'm going to see you yeah. in a month. We'll go hack it up. In a month. Creep. All right. You know how to uh, yeah. sing that song, Creep? Yes, nope. I do. Creepy you got to promise, to, to promise me you'll sing Sketchy Lady, too. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll see it. All well, right, nobody guys. Nobody knows YouTube Peace. Sketchy Lady by Brian Voss. You'll enjoy the song. Guys, have a good one there. Bye, guys. Right. Bye, guys.
Justin, bye bye, BV. Justin, what what a show! And I I want to say shout out to the two of them for yes for joining us and coming on and having this great debate. And also shout out to the 160 or 180 people that we had watching the show tonight. Yeah. Um, and if you love this conversation, be sure and join us every week uh, on Tuesdays yep. at 7 p.m. Because conversations like this happen all the time, um, and the conversations aren't going to stop. No. Um, I'm I'm so I'm ecstatic that we had this many people on the show um, joining in in the comments. I'm I'm sure we had over a hundred comments tonight. Um, yeah, sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, I, I I loved it. I loved the the interaction and the engagement that we had um, from the fans tonight. Um, and I'm glad that all of you were able to to witness a conversation, mm -hmm. discussion, and debate all at the same time um, and, to this level, and, to this capacity. It was really cool. You know, we read Voss's words for about a month. Yeah. And we finally heard him say the words. Right. And he did it very tactfully. He didn't bash anybody. He didn't put anybody into the mud. He was as Hall of Fame as Hall of Fame could be. But you can tell, what does he say? 65, he said? 65? Yeah. At 65, he, blood, sweat, and tears is in this game. Oh, yeah. He, he lives and breathes this game. And he just wants what's best for the next generation. And it's really cool how he said, where is he going to be in 10 years? You know, right. and nobody looks at it like that. Where is bowling going to be in 10 years? Who knows? We never thought bowling would be where it is today, 10 years ago. Right. And uh, so. man, oh man, like it was great. And, you know, I, I don't know if Brian's bowling anymore, or if he is going to bowl anymore, but um, I, I, I don't care what anybody says. A guy like him could still be competitive today. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So you need to go pack because you have to go bowl the college nationals this week. Yeah. The, the bus is leaving in approximately three hours. So I need to oh, go you got pack. plenty. Oh, you have plenty of I time. Got, you have plenty I got, of time. I got plenty of time. But uh, I do want to say if you guys are watching and you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel or like the Facebook page, follow us on Instagram. Go and do that right now so you never miss an update from us. Um, so you can always join us and know whenever we're going live because we, we do this weekly. Um, Every Tuesday. Every Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, we are live. Uh, we'll be back next. Actually, no, we will not be back next week. I am actually at the USBC convention. Go figure next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <so. laughs> um, I'll be at the convention, and then I'm going to the Hall of Fame induction next week. We're going to watch Patrick Allen get inducted to the Hall of Fame. So I'll be there. Uh, we, we'll be back in two weeks. We'll yeah. recap the final to the playoffs, touch on the senior tour a little bit, and then the draft shows in May. Yeah. So, uh, guys, uh, thanks so much for tuning in this episode. Like I said, hit that subscribe button, follow the Facebook page, follow the Instagram page, so you never miss an update from us. Uh, be sure and check out buddiesproshop.com. Use coupon code bone or zone five zone off. five off. Zone five off. Stay five percent off your next order. I'm Justin Bowen, my partner Mike Powell. This is the Bone and Zano Zone, and we will see you guys next time. Thanks so much for a great show. See you guys.